the mad scientist of strength here. I'm sitting down with Brian Carroll of Power Rack Strength. And uh, we're at Exos this weekend, uh, both doing some presenting. And we've had a question come up a number of times from different clinicians about the reverse hyper. There are views on it because obviously it's, uh, it's big in powerlifting. And uh, I wanted to get some opinions. And I'll just start by, well, I'm going to have to break down and, and say something that people probably don't expect me to say right. but uh, I think a lot of times the reverse hyper is not good from a rehab standpoint or a hyper extension in general exactly yes. I'm not saying that the reverse hyper itself is a bad tool if you use it in a in, a, in, a, in the correct manner uh, where we're not inducing flexion uh, to the back it can be used for glute and hamstring development but Think about it from a rehab standpoint. If we take somebody that has just injured their back, they've usually done it in almost all cases except for like auto accidents and stuff. It's happened because of poor movement under load. And poor movement of the back, in regard to the back, is usually done because they have either poor awareness of pelvis position or poor control of pelvis position. So putting them on a device that even if used correctly, requires tons of coaching for control of pelvis position and pelvis control uh, is, is a little counterintuitive. You're basically taking somebody that has already done it poorly and said, well, let's rehab it by putting you on something that requires that you do what you don't know how to do really well. Yeah. And then the other piece is a lot of people, well, maybe you can jump into this, but how people are trained to use it isn't exactly the best approach either. Right, right. Um, my issue with it is the injury that a lot of people are dealing with is would be a herniated disc it's a very common injury and they're under the notion that by doing this motion this flexion under load loosely swinging underneath is going to somehow fix an injury that was caused by flexion under load and that's just misguided at best and i'm not here to bash the reverse hyper and say that it's totally useless i'm not here to say that it doesn't have any uses but in my opinion i would not send someone and i would not do it myself to do sets of reverse hypers to rehab a herniated disc. And I'm speaking from experience here because I used to wonder back in 2009 when I'd start my days off with doing reverse hypers that I would feel good for about 15 minutes. And that's you due to- feel great right afterwards, yep. And that is due to the stretch receptors in the spine that make you feel good for a little while, provide temporary relief, and then seize back up worse than ever. So unfortunately, a lot of people, not only do they not know how to do them properly, but they're doing them for the wrong reasons. And that ends up being a, uh, a long time or a continuum of injury mechanism after injury mechanism over and over and over. And then people wonder why they're not getting better. And that's because they're not letting the area heal. They're just sensitizing it over and over and over. Yeah. I mean, we're basically taking people that have injured their back because they've gone into flexion with load probably repeatedly. And now we're adding lots of volume of repeated loaded flexion. And all we're doing is desensitizing the pain. But the damage itself to the disc, probably getting worse. Yeah. Uh, again, the reverse hyper can be used correctly if we control the pelvis and hip position, and that basically involves not swinging all the way through. Right. Um, but uh, I, I've coached people and used it, but oftentimes we just don't even use it at the gym because it does take a lot of coaching, and I'd rather invest that coaching time on like squatting and deadlifting and stuff. So. Yeah, and you gotta look at the, the pressure on the spine too, whether it's a shearing or the compression with, with different movements. And there's usually a better option. For someone that's suffering from back pain, a better option than a hyperextension or a reverse hyper would be something like a bird dog or natural attraction, whether it's hanging from a, a pull-up bar or whether it's going for a walk every day. There's different things that you can do that are more likely, according to hard science and experience, help you rehab a back better than a reverse hyper. And that's not dogging on Louie. If you want to get as strong as possible, Louie's methods are great. Yeah. There's a lot of good things, but yeah, this is not a bash thing. What we want to do, so the next step here is we want to share our approaches and experience that we have. Uh, both of us have worked with clinicians, with athletes, have done a ton of helping people get back uh, on the platform again. I've had people not able to get out of bed. They're in so much pain and eight weeks later competing at a national level. Yeah. So it's, back pain is totally manageable. It's not a life sentence. It is not. <laughs> I've got herniated discs. After herniated discs, I've squatted and deadlifted over 900 pounds. My best lifts have come after that. So it is not a life sentence by any means. So, and, and before, and before we move, 
that, that what's interesting about what Chris said, and it's the same for me, is an injury like this that is so debilitating and painful and takes so much time to get over, it makes you very, very keen and aware of the positions you put yourself in. And we know that form is all the more important under load. So we actually had to end up putting more thought, time, and effort into our lifting where we couldn't be casual anymore. And then we had more neural drive, we had more focus, and we had more intensity yeah. because we knew we couldn't get away with the things that we used to anymore. Yeah, no, my, it's actually improved my lift because of the, the, you know, that awareness that I've taken to my programming, my movement, all that stuff. Yeah. I still have to, you know, I can't do a lot of heavy conventional holds every week because it will end up being an aggravation factor for me. Yeah. You know, just things that I've got to deal with around that. Yeah. And according so. to the research, these, uh, these fractures, whether implant fractures or disc herniations, they can take up to 10 years to heal and totally desensitize. So even if they're not totally bothering you right now or not apparent, um, it takes a long time for them to heal and that's why it's so important to utilize these tips that we're gonna give you because even though you're not in pain and maybe your MRI still shows some really bad bulges or herniations or even fractures, that doesn't mean you're out of the woods now, you know, right now. So all the more reason why you need to be good to your body and you have a couple tips that you're gonna share and a couple yeah. tips I'm gonna share about how getting out of pain and, and it's not a life sentence. Yeah, it is totally, it's, it's crazy. Um, back pain is the number one healthcare cost in America when we include like lost time from work and all that other stuff. Bigger than AIDS, bigger than heart disease, bigger than cancer. I mean, that's, that's huge. It's a big deal. And it's, it's of those, arguably the one that is the most manageable yourself. So let's talk about managing and yourself. It's self-inflicted. So what, what, are, what are your top things that for dealing with uh, back pain? Well, I had to learn the hard way, but the, the biggest thing that I hammer home to people, and that I can't say it enough, is moving like an athlete and being good to your body outside of the gym and inside the gym. Think of it as a checking account or a savings account. Everything we do is a transaction, good or bad. So if we're expecting to be able to abuse our body, and that's what Chris and I do, we abuse our body in the gym and in competition, this isn't for health or for, for general well-being. It's because we have goals that we want to hit. So with that said, if we're abusing our body in the gym and outside of the gym and burning the candle at both ends, there's going to be limits. We're going to hit a threshold and we're going to tap out. So with that said, by sparing your body and sparing your spine with good hygiene every day when you're moving, this will allow you to build up a uh, balance that you can withdraw from when you're in the gym and you can utilize that to pull you know, a thousand pound deadlift in the gym and be able to walk the next day. Or I can go and break the 242 all time record because I've been building a balance in my account. You burn the candle at both ends, you're too, making too many withdrawals, you're not gonna have any athleticism left. And that's where I was about four years ago, I was tapped out. Moving well is the biggest thing. Core stabilization, with quality, Miguel Big Three. Quality of movement is king, I, I yep. say that all the time. Yep. Uh, you wanna talk about Miguel Big Three? Miguel Big Three is huge for core stabilization and the people that wanna have abs, avoid the sit-ups, avoid the crunches, avoid the flexion, do some stir the pot. Mill Gil, what's up? Oh, I was just gonna say. So, like, um, on the on the on, on the sit up piece. Yeah. Like, Stu's argument is, you know, look, you know, we want to stay out of that loaded spinal flexion. I fully agree. Another piece that's missing from that that a lot of people don't realize is that you actually break down the bracing ability. Yeah. We're disconnecting and training the abs by themselves and not how they're supposed to work, which is in that rigid outer sheath. Watch, uh, you can watch one of my videos on breathing is not bracing for a little bit more details on this, but you break down those neural pathways of like how you create good quality intra-abdominal pressurization. Building the core as a whole, yep. as one, as the internal bone. And then the, the, the stir the pot and stuff like that where we actually have to inflate and brace while we're holding movement. You know, basically any of our like static movements like the plane, the stir the pot, stuff like that, mm -hmm. that actually builds that, that piece and will develop your abs at the same yes, time. Yes, the stir the pot will hit your abs harder than anything else without the shearing and the compression that something like a uh, sit up, weighted sit up, any kind of goofy archaic movement that is uh, more about building mental toughness than anything else. And you can build mental toughness elsewhere instead of doing 5,000 sit ups a day like boxers and people like Mike Tyson used to do, which ended up crushing his spine. Yeah. I broke my back. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, did you hit all three of the middle? Middle big three would be the bird dog. And uh, that's a very simple movement. You're sending one arm, opposite leg back, bracing, um, 
being stiff the whole time, flexing your glutes. It's it's a it's a total body movement. You can you can look it up on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. All the stuff that I'm going to talk about and the video big three are on my movement website, of course, kabuki.ms. Um, but a lot of the stuff you're going to be able to find with a little bit of research. So, yeah. uh, what are the other uh, the other two? The roll to side plank is the way I refer to it. Has a couple different names. Neutral plank position, rolling, keeping the pelvis and the. Uh, the rib cage attached, rolling as one and then bridging for a couple of seconds and holding it, keeping your oblique and your glute off the floor, then rolling back. There's different ways you can do these, but you want it to be as one and smooth. And then lastly, for the people again that want to build their abs, is simply the McGill curl up. And it's supporting the lumbar spine with your hands, winging your elbows forward, and just moving your head just enough to engage your abs, making them stiff. And you're not doing them right unless you are visibly shaking and being stiff. Whenever I go around and touch people and they say, I'm going to punch you in the gut, what are you going to do? They all of a sudden become stiff when they say that before they couldn't you, feel you it. You punch people in the gut and you're Sometimes. Yes. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We have a lot in common, I've noticed. Yes. So that's the McGill Big Three. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple on pain management. Like, so the McGill Big Three is all about developing the bracing strategies and the stability that you need so that, uh, that you don't injure yourself. But sometimes it's like, I'm in pain today. Like, what do I do right now? So my recommendations there are learning the cat camel and the, and the McKinsey press up. So if you do both of those, like two sets of 20 and then repeat that as a circuit, uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with disc injuries or you know, flexion intolerance, we'll say, mm -hmm. um, you definitely wanna do that in the morning and possibly two or three, you know, a second and third time during the day. If you're training, definitely pre-training as well. You'll find that the pain goes down. You don't need to take pain medication, so this is a great way to teach yourself that you can manage this stuff yourself. And then I'll throw in uh, one other stabilization because again, stabilization is the root of what we've done. So I really love um, the dead bug because it's going to reinforce the patterns actually that you need in the dead, in the, uh, the, in the bird dog and also the, 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 uh, the rolling plank or even stir the pots, any of those items, but really teaches you rib cage and pelvis position and then bracing once we've got that in position. Um, there's a lot of details and intricacies to doing that correctly, so highly recommend checking out, again, kabuki.ms for that. But um, that's a great way to take home and work on those, those strategies. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. And then we, you already talked about like the, you know, the life. You need, to, you need to look at that capacity. You've got limited capacity. So it doesn't mean like if you've got to pick something up off the floor or get out of your car that you're fully braced. Because then you're going to be using all of your resources for bracing. So when it comes to lift heavy, you might be fatigued. Right. So it's a threshold. Like, don't be sloppy. Like yesterday, you know, we're at a movement place with a bunch of clinicians, and Brian and I are sitting by the side watching people pick up mats off the ground, and they're just doing it with really bad form. They forgot everything that we just talked about the movement mm -hmm. and regressed to like, oh, just being sloppy. It has to become habitual. It has so, to be second nature, just like your lifting form. When you're under load, when you're locked in, the same thing was just simply bending into a lunge to pick up a yoga mat instead of using your lower back. Yeah. This becomes cumulative. It so, all becomes cumulative, good or bad. But if you've got those issues, I mean, people throw out their back picking up the kids' toys, getting out of the car, you know, like these little things, add a little rotation, a little bend, but work, you know, you need to stabilize with that, but think about it from a threshold standpoint, like how stable do I need to be for this? I need a little bit of stability for that, okay? Well, how am I moving? Am I, you know, where am I, where am I moving about? Am I moving about the hip or am I using the flexion in my back? The back is meant to move. Yeah. It is meant to move. So we're not saying like, don't move the back. But when you got load, you need to look at like, what level of strategy do I need to have? So, so those, uh, those are our tips for managing back pain. You know, look, at, look this stuff up, uh, look up McGill's work. Um, uh, uh, my friend's website, uh, fixyourownback.com, uh, has a, a ton of great resources as well. Uh, but with these quick tips, you know, you know you're going to go a long ways. Yeah, we got a big and I have a book coming out in 2017 that basically describes the process of rehabbing the back along with the science, the tips, how we did it, how you can fix your own back, and it's been a culmination of ultimate back fitness and performance, low back disorders back mechanic, 1020 life, and a whole host of other things to get, not just, this isn't for powerlifters, it's gonna be for people <laughs> that want, that have back pain and think it's a life sentence when it isn't, because there's nothing on the earth more demanding than, from a lower back than powerlifting. 
it's certainly not for powerlifting. We're here uh, working this presenting this weekend. There's not a single powerlifter in the audience. It's all physical therapists, chiros, strength coaches that are working with Olympic lifters, sprinters. Like they didn't bring us in here to learn powerlifting. Right. So, um, but these these principles apply to everything. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks for for listening to this video. And again, you can check out Ryan on PowerRackStrength.com or um, you can check out the uh, Kabuki Strength team on KabukiStrength.com. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Brian.